Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another Rethinking Your Retirement uh, Directed IRA workshop. We'll get underway here in a second. Give some, give a couple minutes for some people to get logged in. Happy morning or afternoon to you guys, wherever you guys are at. I've got a good workshop for you guys today. My favorite topic, which is private lending out of self-directed IRAs. I love it because I do it myself. And let's just jump into it. Uh, this is my favorite topic. Like I said, private money lending using self-directed IRAs. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it from a lender's perspective, but I'm also going to talk about it from a borrower's perspective. Um, because it's important to understand how retirement accounts can be used as a private capital source, whether you're a lender or a borrower. Some of my best clients over the years have been both. Um, they might have a self-directed IRA and they like to loan to other real estate investors and potentially that, that act unlocks other people's IRA so that they can buy more property personally. I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can work both ends of the stick there, um, but really just talk about what why would you somebody want to be a lender with their retirement account? How does that even work? Most people are just used to buying stocks and bonds. How do you create a note within a retirement account? We'll talk about the fundamentals of it and how it actually works. We'll talk about some IRA rules when it comes to self-direction and when it comes to doing alternative investments like buying real estate or lending on real estate you got to understand there are some rules as to who your IRA is allowed to transact with. But really, the IRS doesn't care about what we invest in. They more care about who we invest with. So once you understand that, knowledge is power. You can really go out there and really create your own retirement based on your terms and invest in what you know best. Uh, you, know, you don't have to be a real estate expert either to know a little bit more about real estate than you do the stock market. I would say most of the people I run into understand how a three bedroom, two bath house works versus how, you know, why Walmart stock goes up or down, you know, daily. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. What are the benefits of being a lender? What are some considerations to lending? So these are just considerations that I've learned over my years of being a lender. And then we got some actual case studies from clients that I've had over the past decade of my experience. Um, and then we'll tap it in with the, uh, the bar's perspective and, and I'll take questions along the way. So let's jump into the first one. And since there's a lot of people on here, just a quick introduction. It's not about me, but my name is Nate Hare. I'm the executive director at Directed IRA. I started my career 2002, right out of college, jumping right into real estate. I was in the lending business. I still am a, a licensed loan officer in, in most states in the country. I'm not an active loan officer, but that's how I kind of started with my real estate career. I've owned almost 20 rental properties uh, in my lifetime. I don't really like owning rental properties anymore. Because once I found out the other side of real estate, which is the financing side, I really just kind of stuck to that. And there's a lot of different reasons why I like to stick to the financing side of real estate. Um, and truth be told, most of the clients that we have at Directed IRA, even though we talk so much about buying real estate inside a self-directed IRA, very few of our clients actually hold fee simple real estate in their IRAs. They hold more passive investments like notes, which we're going to talk about today. So um, I first learned about self-directed IRAs in 2012 when I was recruited by a company. And I was blown away by the concept because, A, I thought, how come nobody ever taught me this? What, how come I've been in you know the lending business and I've owned my own real estate personally and through my LLCs? How come nobody told me I can actually do that same type of investing in a retirement account? and pay no taxes on the gains. I thought, is this illegal? Why, how come everybody doesn't teach this you know, on a, on a regular basis? So I became passionate about just sharing what I've learned in self-directed IRAs. And I've been in the business for over a decade now. And I just, I just love sharing the information. What you guys do with it is up to you guys, but self-directed IRAs have truly for myself uh, created a better retirement vehicle for me and a lot of the clients that we help here at Directed IRA. Um, but as a self-directed IRA custodian, what we're not giving you on any of these programs, our workshops, our webinars, our podcasts, is any tax, legal, or investment advice. We're not licensed to tell you what you should or you shouldn't invest in. We're not licensed to sell you anything. I don't want to sell you anything. I want you guys to pick your own investments when it comes to your retirement accounts. What we do provide you at, self, at, at Directed IRA is the vehicle or the IRA or 401k that will enable you to buy things outside of Wall Street. That's all that we do. So even though we invest ourselves, all the information here is for education purposes only. We always encourage you to consult with your professionals before entering into any type of investment. 
So let's just talk about real quick, just IRAs in general, IRAs and 401ks and retirement accounts. What are they allowed to own? Well, by law, the uh, an IRA or a retirement account can own almost anything. It can own anything you can hold title to. Most people think, well, wow, I thought my IRA or 401k was only meant for stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, REITs, or CDs or insurance products. That's one investment class. And the reason why most people just think that's the only investment that they can invest in is because most Americans have their retirement account locked up at a Fidelity or a Charles Schwab or a Wells Fargo Advisors. And when you have an, a, an account with them or you have a retirement account with them, just understand the nature of their business. Fidelity and Charles Schwab is in the nature to sell invest, investments. That's their business. They're a licensed securities broker. They sell stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. They make money in commissions by selling stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. So when it comes to the accounts you set up with them, they're only going to allow you to hold what they sell. It doesn't mean that's the only thing you can own when you look at the IRS or the IRA rules. When it comes to your IRA or your 401k or your 403b or your TRS or your TSP, you're allowed to own anything in those accounts except life insurance contracts and collectibles. Those are the only two investment restrictions laid out by the IRS. When you look at the investments outside of your traditional investments, and we call them alternative investments, those are things that include things like rental property, fix and flips, commercial property, multifamily, private equity, private stock, cryptocurrency, investments into syndications. And what we'll talk about here today is promissory notes. What we do at Directed IRA in order to give, have, give our clients the ability to buy those is really no different than what Fidelity does when you buy stock. When you buy stock in your Fidelity IRA, what they ultimately do when you push a button, say buy, they exchange your IRA's asset of cash for an asset of a stock. The document they hold showing what your IRA owns is a stock certificate. When you tell directed IRA to invest in real estate, we're going to exchange an asset of cash for an asset of real estate or today's program, an asset of cash for an asset of a promissory note. What we hold is not a stock certificate, but if we're holding a note, we hold the actual note. And we'll talk about the process of how you can actually make sure your IRA is vested as the lender. You do the process safely and securely. But any investment you do that you want your IRA to own, you just have to work through your custodian. You work through Fidelity if you want to buy stocks and bonds. You work through Directed IRA if you want to buy alternative investments. Most of our clients have IRAs at both places. Why? because that gives you true, true diversification. I'm not against stocks or bonds. I just think if you want to diversify, you should have the ability to invest in things outside of the stock market. If you're interested in things outside of the stock market, like rental property, fix and flips, or promissory notes. But again, the IRS does not restrict us as to what we're allowed to invest in other than life insurance contracts and collectibles. You just have to find a company that's willing to hold the investment that you want to buy. So why are notes and loans so attractive as a self-directed IRA investment? Well, some of the benefits that I see as far as it being a using my IRA as a lender and owning a promissory note inside it is it's a real estate investment, but at the end of the day, it's a passive real estate investment. When your IRA is the lender, or just say you are a lender, you don't deal with toilets, tenants, or any ownership headaches. That's really going to be dealt with by the borrower and who the and the owner, which is probably going to be the same person. If you think about it, banks are in the business to loan money. They don't like to own property. So if you want to ask yourself, well, is, is lending or passive uh, investing in real estate a good investment strategy? Go walk down to Wells Fargo or Chase or Bank of America. Ask them what they would rather have. Would they rather have residual income coming in monthly from interest payments from borrowers? Or do they want to own a bunch of rental property that they got to deal with toilets and tenants and, and ownership headaches? So if you look at that model, well, banks do it on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And banks make a lot of money just by placing their dollars out there secured by real estate and they get interest payments. You can use the same strategy in your retirement account and have your IRA as the bank getting residual income from borrowers. And we'll talk about how you can find those borrowers and what you want to do to vet those borrowers. 
Self-directed IRAs, whether you invest in notes or real estate or cryptocurrency or invest in something else, it does give you better diversification than just a you know traditional IRA fidelity that you can just buy high-risk mutual funds, medium-risk mutual funds, and some low-risk mutual funds. So just the mere fact of having a self-directed IRA will enable you to be better diversified, in my opinion. Not giving you tax advice, but I just think diversification into alternatives is a better way to truly diversify than just having different risk class of mutual funds. IRAs and 401ks are better when it comes to taxes. Our money grows much faster in an IRA or a 401k, and this is ultimately true as a lender. Most people that have money and they want to be a lender, there's really no way to get tax deductions if you're lending your personal money. Now, there's different ways in real estate where if you're re re investing your personal dollars, how you can get tax deductions and cost segregation. There's a lot of different strategies on how you can kind of minimize taxes when you invest with your personal funds when you buy real estate. But when you lend on real estate, there's less, I would say, tax advantages that you get by lending personal dollars. But you still get the same tax savings lending out of an IRA, whether it's tax deferred growth, if you're lending out of a traditional IRA or pre-tax IRA or a rollover IRA, all of the interest income that your IRA generates will be tax deferred at the very minimum. Or if you're lending out of a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k, an HSA or an ESA, well, the all the interest income to those accounts are completely tax-free. So there is kind of a bigger, I guess, shift in benefits when you're when you're looking to be a lender because you don't get many tax benefits outside of an IRA being a lender, but you get a whole lot of tax benefits, the same benefits you would get lending inside of an IRA that your other investments get, which is either tax-deferred or tax-free growth. The other thing that I really like about lending, and this is probably the thing I like the best, is that it's predictable. And what I mean by predictable is when you're the lender, or let's just say when your IRA is the lender, and we'll talk about this in the case studies, it's really a negotiation between you, the IRA owner, using your IRA as a lender, and your potential borrower. You agree to terms where that borrower is going to make payments back to your IRA based on the terms of your promissory note. The terms of your promissory note can be when payments are supposed to be made, how much is the interest, When's the loan supposed to be paid off? When you factor all those things in and it's documented, that becomes predictable. When I invest my money out and I put it out on the streets through my Roth IRA as a lender or my HSA as a lender, and I have case studies that come up here and dis discuss this, I know on the first of the month, my borrower is supposed to make a payment back to my IRA custodian. It's supposed to be deposited in my account. I don't have to turn on CNBC and see what the value of my note is going up and down. I know the value of it. It's the same principal value I loan, and I know when I'm supposed to get money in. If I don't get money in, then there's a process for that. But it's predictable in the fact that I know when money's supposed to come in, I know when the borrower is supposed to pay off, and I can track it on a, data, on, on a monthly basis based on the terms of my note. So it's predictable. And that I, I mean, there's not very many investments out there when it comes to retirement where you can actually predict what you're supposed to earn. Promissory notes would probably be one of the exceptions to that. Well, with self-directed IRAs, they just allow you to invest in what you know best. If you understand real estate, you, you probably understand notes. So I would probably say you're better suited investing your retirement account at least into something you understand versus just investing in stocks or bonds because that's what you thought you had to invest in. So what are the things that you can, what are the types of plans that you can use to loan out of? And these are the self-directed plans that we have at directed IRA and directed trust company. There's really seven types of plans. And this is the meat and potatoes. If you take one screenshot of one slide, just take a screenshot of this slide. Okay. The important thing about every one of these plans listed here, Traditional IRA, Roth IRA, SEP IRA, Simple IRA, Solo 401k, HSA, which is a health savings account, or education savings account, the ESA, all of these are not people. Each one of these accounts is a tax-exempt trust. By definition, they're tax-exempt trusts. Your role as the account owner is you're the fiduciary to the trust. That just means 
My job to my IRA, my job to my HSA is to put money in as a contribution, give it some investment capital, and then invest it. While I'm buying and selling investments within whatever plan I choose to use, all of the growth is exempt from taxes. Now, exempt could mean exempt as, as I don't have to pay taxes as I buy and sell things, which could be tax deferred growth. Or if it's a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k, HSA and ESA, well, my growth not only could be deferred, but I could defer growth and even take tax-free distributions. While I'm investing with these plans, I'm going to get some sort of tax saving within the plan that I don't get as an individual. See, if I invest 100 grand of my money, I pay taxes every single year. Even, even if I'm lending, Uncle Sam's going to hit me with 30 or 40% that I got to give him back. And that slows the process of my money growing. If I can leverage these plans and some of my investments into plans that aren't taxed on an annual basis, well, my money grows much faster. And I'm not saying you have to do every investment in a retirement plan, but if you're not leveraging some sort of plan to grow tax deferred or tax free, and you're just trying to invest your money, it's going to be hard because you're going to spin your wheels trying to keep up with the taxes you have to pay each year because you got a silent partner, Uncle Sam. So these are the seven plans that you can loan money out of. And we'll talk about the process here in a second, but these would be the seven plans that you can self-direct and loan money out of. Now, oftentimes, if you are if you have a borrower that has a property that they want to buy and you'd like your retirement account or accounts to be the lender, sometimes you might not have quite enough money in one IRA to loan to your borrower. Important concept to understand is that IRAs can be partnered together. I've partnered on several deals where we had seven or eight IRAs all partnered together on one promissory note. Okay, You can partner with as many different accounts as you like, and sometimes this helps you if you're trying to meet the capital requirement of one of your borrowers. Most people that partner accounts together, I'll just tell you, are usually partnering, let's say, husband's Roth IRA with wife's Roth IRA. Maybe husband's traditional IRA with brother's traditional IRA. Maybe their old 401k with their HSA or something to that effect. Okay, But partnering is something you want to have in the back of your head because you don't have to just do one loan out of one account. You can partner different accounts together to be on the same loan or the same promissory note. And again, once we get to the case studies, it'll kind of make a lot of sense. But partnering is a key component, especially if you're looking to get your money off of the sidelines. Now, what's different amongst the accounts that you partner on, though, is that when you partner accounts together, in most cases, if people are related, the income coming back on that investment or on that loan are split pro rata amongst the accounts that are used, okay? When you think about how these IRAs and HSAs work, you want to, you can really get really sexy with this and actually strategize how you want to use that income coming back from one of your borrowers. For instance, I self-direct my Roth IRA and my HSA, okay? Now, the reason is, is because I've got two accounts that are beneficial to me that give me tax advantages, but a Roth IRA and an HSA work very differently. Roth IRA distribution rules, I'm going to be better suited not taking any money out of my Roth IRA until I'm 59 and a half. My HSA, on the other hand, that works differently. Money earned into my HSA, my health savings account, and we have classes on this if you want to go look at the classes, but I can take distributions out of my HSA earnings the day that makes earnings to pay for glasses, acupuncture, holistic medicine, co-pays. I can pay for current expenses with tax-free dollars by just taking distributions out of my HSA. So when I partner my Roth IRA, my HSA together on a loan to an investor, and that investor makes one interest payment back to, let's say, directed IRA, directed IRA splits that payment pro rata amongst my Roth IRA and my HSA. But I know in the back of my head, if I need to pay for some medical expenses, I've got some tax-free bucket of money in my health savings account that I can use right away. I've got some money over here in my Roth IRA that I don't want to touch that's going to be better to touch once I'm 59 and a half. 
when you look at the other accounts though too is depending on your needs if you've got kids under the age of 18 that are going to private school maybe they're not going to private school you're buying them tuition or you're paying for tuition books computers ipads your home internet bill those are qualified expenses that you can use to pay out of Loverdell education savings accounts earnings so partnering is really key depending on what your need and use for money is because if you've got some retirement accounts that you want to get rolling, but you've also got some health expenses for your family and some kids with some education expenses, well, you'll learn today that you could partner all of those accounts together on just one promissory note, have one borrower pay interest, pro rata all to those accounts, and use some of the profit today and save some of the profit for tomorrow. So that would be called partnering. The biggest thing is when you're talking about individuals that are going to participate in maybe a lender borrower situation we got to first discuss some ira rules as to how you're not allowed to structure deals what i described back here is really all the accounts let's just say they're all my accounts these would all be if i'm lending to an individual let's say i'm lending to darren right darren's not a disqualified person to me or my iras but let's say darren's a real estate investor I can partner all my accounts on one side of the fence as the lender and loan to Darren, okay? Because he's not a disqualified person. What the IRS doesn't want me to do is partner my accounts together and loan back to me. That would be what's called a prohibited transaction. There's certain people that my IRAs, my HSAs, my ESAs are not allowed to loan to, and those would be considered disqualified people. Remember, me and my IRAs and my HSAs are two different people, right? I'm just the fiduciary to the plan, but I get my benefit from the plan from the distributions I take out of the plan. But I can't, as the fiduciary, tell my plans to make a loan to me. That would be prohibited. Okay? You can't be on opposite ends of the fence. I can't use my IRA as the lender and me personally be the borrower or vice versa. There's other people that are equally disqualified. And I'll take a couple of questions after this because this is a good point to take questions. But there's other people that are equally disqualified to your IRA as you, the IRA owner. The other people that your IRAs cannot loan to would be your spouse, your kids, your parents or your grandparents, and spouses of your kids. This also includes any entities, any LLCs that those same family members own, control, or manage. So let me just repeat the disqualified people, the people you're not allowed to loan money to out of any of your plans. You can't loan to yourself, can't loan to your spouse, can't loan to your parents or your kids or their spouses or any uh, companies those same people own, control, or manage. Now, you might have meant, notice I didn't mention family to the side. That's family to the side, aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews. How come just these people up and down the line and spouses are disqualified, but family to the side are not? It really just has to come down to inheritance. When you die, most likely your assets pass to the spouse or pass to the kids. The same thing goes in the IRA world. Most of the time when you die, your IRA turns into an inherited IRA that goes to your spouse or to your kids. So if they're going to be in the line of inheritance, they're automatically disqualified to your IRA. It doesn't even matter if they do inherit it. Just the mere fact that they're your spouse or your kids or parents makes them a disqualified person. But brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews, they're not by law a disqualified person. Because So could my Roth IRA loan to my brother? Yes, it could. Could it loan to my son? No, it can't. Um, those would be the disqualified people. It's just understand that disqualified persons cannot transact with your IRA, cannot loan money out of the IRA to those people. You can't, can't give a loan to the, your IRA from those people. And you can't transact on any level with those people when it comes to your IRA's investment. Your benefit and the benefit of your heirs comes from the distributions that you take from the plan. So invest your money, take, take the money out as a distribution, but you can't loan money to yourself. Um, Darren or uh, Michelle, are there any questions here? Oh, let me see. Will they be will we be sharing the slides afterwards? Yes. If you're registered for this, we're going to give you tomorrow, we give you the copy of the recording and the slides. So good question uh, there. Nate, um, Jay yeah. asks, how does selling a note work to make money versus earning monthly income by holding the note? 
So we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the case studies. So good question. We'll talk a little bit about the different ways that you can earn money. And I even have two different case studies on how you can structure deals a little bit differently that both work very well. So good, good question. And it looks like Richard has a question. If I lend from my IRA LLC, do I have to file a 1099 for interest received? I think you mean the 1098 to the borrower. Uh, most borrowers are going to request a 1098 because they're going to write off the interest. Um, but as far as your IRA LLC or your IRA is concerned, there's no taxation. You might have to prepare one for them, but there's no taxable event to the IRA or the IRA LLC. Okay? Good question. But that 1098 is probably something your borrower is going to want um, on, a, on a yearly basis. Okay? All right. So let's talk a little bit about more about lending and some considerations to make before being a lender. So one of the things that I always hear is, well, Nate, what about foreclosure? If I use my IRA plans and I've got a borrower that's going to buy some real estate, what about foreclosure? Well, I would say, well, what about it? Okay, Foreclosure is just a, a thing that happens when your borrower fails to make payments or fails to pay on the agreement specified in the note. Foreclosure doesn't have to be a scary thing, but what I would tell you is that if you're going to be a lender, either inside or outside of an IRA, make sure you just understand, A, what state and how, what state is the property in that you're loaning on, and how does the foreclosure process work in that state? Every state is different. Some states work through a judicial foreclosure state, and some states work as a non-judicial state. Most of the judicial foreclosure states work off a, off a document called a mortgage. Most of the non-judicial states work off a document called a deed of trust. Now, both documents are important to you as a lender, okay, because the mortgage or the deed of trust gives you rights to the property in the event your borrower fails to make payments. Now, in a judicial foreclosure state, if your borrower fails to make payments, all that really means, and I'm just oversimplifying it, all that means is you've got to file a lawsuit to, uh, against the borrower and you've got to go through the court system. Anytime you got to go through the court system, it's probably going to take you a little bit longer to get that process done so that you can retain rights to the property if your borrower stops making payments. But at the end of the day, the good thing is, is you're secured by a, a tangible asset. It's different than investing in a stock and, the, and a stock in a company that goes bankrupt. You don't have any recourse on that investment going south. If I do a loan out of my Roth IRA and my Roth IRA's loan is secured by a mortgage or a deed of trust, depending on what happens, if that borrower fails to make payments, I have rights as a lender to take that property back through foreclosure. A, I just have to work through the courts if it's a judicial foreclosure state, or I go through non-judicial foreclosure states, which make it a little bit easier because I don't have to file a lawsuit against the borrower. All I really have to do is start the foreclosure process, which would include things like if my borrower misses a payment, starting the foreclosure process in specifically a non-judicial state, the first thing I do as a lender is I send a notice of default. I just have a template or I have an attorney draft a notice of default that basically just says to my borrower, I notice you missed the payment, okay? If they don't fix or rectify the payment after a certain amount of days, I send an acceleration of the notice saying, hey, you've got X amount of days to make this payment, make these payments and these costs up or these penalties up, or I'm gonna take the property or sell it through auction. And if it goes past a certain date, depending on the state that you're in, you can finalize the foreclosure by basically going to the court, county courthouse and finalizing it and taking it through, through auction. Now, I loan specifically in Texas. Okay, I'll tell you why I loan in Texas. Okay, Texas, it's very easy to foreclose in the event my borrower misses a payment on investment property. I do not loan on owner-occupied property. I think it's silly to loan on owner-occupied property. I'll just be honest with you. At the end of the day, I don't want my money secured by a property that they live in as their primary residence. Okay? Plus, you deal with all sorts of laws called Dodd-Frank laws. Okay, They're going to be a little bit stricter on you as a lender as to how you can foreclose and the things you can do. Okay, I'm mainly or always, I'll say I'll always loan on just investment property. So a real estate investor that's buying a fix and flip, right? Or a real estate investor that's going to buy a rental property. 
I'm going to loan on that property because I know that if that investor doesn't pay me, I can take the property back in foreclosure and I can just continue to rent the, to the renters if there's renters in there. I don't have to kick somebody out of the house or kick somebody out of their primary residence and I don't have to deal with all the, all the rules with Dodd-Frank. Okay? But I like Texas because A, I understand the foreclosure laws. Texas is very, very, I guess, easy on lenders that are secured by investment property. And you can foreclose in as little as 90 days. They have all the auction every first Tuesday of the month. You can really do it in 60 days, but just because of how the how the timeline works, you normally aren't going to get the property back for 90 days. But 90 days is extremely fast for me to take title to a property if my borrower starts misses payments. Now, why is that important to me? Well, if it's an investment in my retirement account and I'm no longer receiving interest payments from the borrower and for some reason they stop paying, I want to be able to take title to the property so I can either sell the property and get my money back or rent it and turn it into a performing asset again. The longer I have to wait to foreclose, the, the higher my chances of losing money are. And there's certain states that I'll never loan in. I mean, no offense, but New York, I'm ne I would never loan in New York because it takes two years to get your property back. So just understand if you're going to be a lender just understand the state that you want to loan in. If it's the state you live in, fine. That's there's that's great. But a lot of people invest in states outside of the state they live in because their state just is a very onerous process when it comes to foreclosure. And this is just something that you want to consider. Now, most people that have loans that go into default, I will tell you this because I've seen a lot of these. It's not that the borrower was a bad person. It's not that the borrower just disappeared. But you have to prepare for foreclosure in the event your borrower dies or your borrower gets sick. Because that's just life. And you've, you've got your money out on the streets, loaned to a real estate investor, and you're secured properly you know, through a mortgage or a deed of trust. You just want to understand what do you need to do in the event the borrower stops paying. On the flip side, I'll tell you this. As a borrower, you should be educating your lenders on how the foreclosure process, process works. You should be straightforward. If you're somebody looking to raise private capital and you're going and tapping into other people's retirement accounts, you should be the first one to tell them, here's how you foreclose on me if I don't pay you back. Now, what do you think that tells a potential lender if the first thing you explain to them is how you take the property back? Well, I would say, first of all, you're breaking down a huge barrier for trust right there because you're showing them, hey, life could happen to me. And I want to make sure you as the lender you know how you can get this property back to foreclosure. And if you're the real estate expert, ex explain to them how the foreclosure process works in the state that you're buying property in. I just think it's going to unlock more money to you if you're transparent with that. And at the end of the day, you want your you want your lenders to feel comfortable. Um, you want your borrower, you want your lenders to feel like they can trust you. But at the end of the day, too, as a lender, you want to make sure that you understand it, too. Don't rely just on your borrower to explain it to you. So... Um, let me see. Any questions? Let's see. We've got a couple questions here. Where do you get contracts to learn about terms of lending? Um, great question, Christy. So on contracts, when you're talking about the contract, we're probably the promissory note. I would probably say you want to go through an attorney that will draft you a good promissory note. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the different way, the different terms that you can include, but I would always get an attorney to draft it. Some people go to title companies. I just use a lender's attorney to be honest. So just find a lender's, attor lender's attorney in the state that you're lending in and just make sure that they've got the, the document, you know, the terms in there specified. Don't try to do it on your own, especially if you're doing one for the first time. I would say at least get a promissory note drafted the first time through with an attorney. And you could probably, you know, if your loans are similar, you could probably use that same kind of draft. I, I, I hate saying draft because you don't want to just reuse the same document, but I would always say go to, go to an attorney first, a, re, a real estate attorney or a lender's attorney. Um, let's see. Me. Yeah, I'll take, yep. Can go you ahead, go Michelle. into clarity on um, how you co-invest your personal funds and IRA funds on the same investment? Yes. So um, let me go back a little bit and just to this slide real quick. Okay. So remember that if my, let's say that I'm going to loan in this slide, let's say that I've got a traditional IRA, but I've also got some personal money. Okay. So if I've got retirement money and I've got personal money and they both want to be on the same side of the fence, and let's say we're going to do a loan to Michelle, Michelle's the borrower, 
Okay, Michelle's not a disqualified person. So am I allowed to partner side by side with my personal funds and my IRA funds? The answer is yes. The difference is you've got to make sure that A, all the income comes back pro rata based on how much each party put in. Let's say that I put in 70% of the capital from my Roth IRA and I put 30% of the capital from my personal funds. On the note, it's going to specify that my Roth IRA is 70% lender and me personally are going to be 30% lender. And I'll show this to you here in a second. The difference when I'm blown, when I'm partnered personally comes into the accounting piece of it. When the borrower makes a payment, let's say Michelle's going to make a payment and let's just say it's a thousand bucks interest payment monthly. If I'm, if I'm partnered with myself, she can't send $1,000 to directed IRA and directed IRA cut me a check for 300 bucks because anything that directed IRA cuts me has to be a distribution. So if I'm partnered with myself personally, the unfortunate thing for Michelle in this case is she's going to have to send two checks. She's going to have to have, send a $700 check or 70% of the check to directed IRA and kind of separate $300 check to me personally. If I'm doing it through an LLC that I'm partnered on, let's say it's a multi-member LLC where my IRA owns a piece and my uh, and my personal funds, I own a piece. Well, then that's just going to be dumped in one bank account, but you still have to make sure that the accounting stays congruent to those ownership percentages. So when you break down that LLC, if it's 70-30, 70% of the profit goes back to directed trust company and deposit into your IRA and you only keep 30% of it. So you can partner with yourself personally. You just got to make sure you keep the accounting separate and you don't commingle funds unless you're using an entity that you've already partnered on together. So I hope that answered that question. Is there another one, Michelle? Yes. Another good one is if I lend to a non-disqualified person to purchase property and that okay. property is leased to a nonprofit where I am the director, am I prohibited from receiving compensation on the nonprofit side? Yes. So anytime, really anytime your IRA is invested into anything where in some way, shape or form, it, it doesn't matter how many entities are in between, you pocket profit from that investment, it's going to be called disqualified. So what I always tell people is just anything that you got going on personally, keep your IRA out of those investments. If it winds up back into your pocket somehow, it's just going to be deemed prohibited. You know, it's not something the IRS finds on a daily basis, but you don't want them picking on you. And if they do find that out, there's probably a paper trail for it. And you're going to lose, you're going to lose your entire IRA doing something like that. So if, you, if you've got some personal investments, I just say, leave your IRA out of it. There's plenty of other you know, investors out there that you can your IRA can do business with. Just don't do it with yourself, even if it's through a couple different entities like that. Is there another question? No? Okay. Um, so, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna go over a couple, uh, some other considerations of being a lender and then go over some case studies. So what are some other considerations you wanna make prior to lending money? I would first, th the first thing is, Loan on something you'd be excited to own, okay? Loan on a property that you understand. Loan on a property that's comfortable to you in the event of default. You want, just want to make sure you're happy to own it, right? It's in you, Maybe it's in your neighborhood. Maybe it's a three-bedroom, two-bath house. You know exactly what to do with it. But be careful loaning, even if the terms sound really good, be careful on loaning on an investment that you would be, feel uncomfortable owning. Like if you're not comfortable owning for or commercial property, don't loan on commercial property. If you're not if you're not comfortable owning a property in Virginia, don't loan on a property in Virginia. So just first rule of thumb, loan on something you would be excited to own. Uh, number two, don't be afraid to hire professionals to help you evaluate your deals, especially if you're new. Okay. Now, I've run across a lot of professionals through attending local RIAs, uh, through attending events like the DME, like Nathan Turner was talking about. Um, I like to loan a, if it's not in Texas, I like to loan where I've got boots on the ground. I have got boots on the ground in North Carolina. And what I mean by boots on the ground is I've got people that I trust that if I did have a deal come across my desk and I was looking for my IRAs to be the lender, I could reach out and pick up the phone and call somebody and say, Hey, can you tell me what you think the comps are on this property? Or I know at least at the end of the day, if I get myself into trouble on one of my loans, I have somebody in that state that can help me go look at the property, go do something, but don't be afraid to leverage professionals, even if you're a lender and even if you're passive. 
When you're structuring the terms of the note, I would say one thing you want to consider is make sure you collect monthly interest on the note. The beautiful thing about being a lender with your retirement account and, and the borrowers, you guys get to create your own loan terms. And the loan terms can be everything from the maturity of the date, which means how long, when does the loan have to be paid back in full? The interest rate, okay, how much how much interest is the borrower going to pay? The terms, when, when they're going to make the payments, are they going to make it monthly? Are they going to make it annually? Are they going to make it bi-monthly, right? Those can be in, in, inserted into the note. Be careful doing a note that doesn't require your borrower to make monthly interest payments or some sort of interest payments. What I mean by that is you can make a note, and I've seen these notes where the lender is an IRA, the borrower is a person, and the note maturity date is five years in the future. But according to the note, there's no interest payments due. All the, all the interest is due at the five-year term when the note's supposed to be paid off in full. Problem with that is, is if you're not requiring your borrower to make payments, it's very hard to call your borrower in default. Even if you know the borrower is in trouble, even if you loan money out to a person and you hear from through the grapevine, maybe through ARIA, that they're, they haven't paid people back. Well, if your note doesn't require them to make payments, it's going to be very hard to get that property back in foreclosure because what are you saying they've done wrong? So just be careful on going too far into your note without asking the borrower to make some sort of payment so that you can see, are they on track or are they off track? If they are off track, don't delay, take action immediately. Now, how most foreclosure processes work is if your borrower misses a payment, the first step in the foreclosure process is not just to take the property. The first step is just to send the notice of default. You'd be surprised how many borrowers pay the next day when you just send that letter, the notice of default saying, I as the lender notice that your payment was past due. Now, a lot of people ask who sends the notice of default? Does directed IRA send the notice of default? We don't handle anything when it comes to investment documents like that. When it comes to a document like that, you're going to want an attorney to just draft a letter, it's usually pretty inexpensive, maybe a hundred bucks, and they send that to your borrower. But you want it to look like it comes from an attorney. You don't want it handwritten or something like that. But that usually will get your borrower on the right track. And that's the first step in the process of foreclosure. So what I've seen some uh, investors get in trouble with is they don't do anything and the borrower misses a payment and they might pick up the phone and call the borrower and say, hey, are you going to pay this month? And the borrower gives them a story and you know they don't see a payment come in. And meanwhile, the, borrower, the, the lender or the IRA owner doesn't send a notice of default. And it goes another month and it goes another month. I had a client wait five years before they did anything, before they sent the notice of default, before they re really got into a bad situation. But as the IRA owner, as the IRA fiduciary, you have to take action and take action immediately. Do not delay if your borrower misses a payment. And what I mean by do not delay is just send the notice of default. Get that step out of the way because you can't get to the finish line. You can't finish something you haven't started. And foreclosure process is, is kind of one of those processes. You have to start it and there's steps in order for you to actually physically foreclose. But a lot of times you start it, they'll pay right away. If you're funding a deal that has a large rehab, be careful on how much you front for the rehab cost. Now, this can be, you could play with this number. Okay. I've done loans where I've loaned $75,000 out, and this is in the case study. I've led $75,000 out. The borrower needed $25,000 for repair. Okay, how do you handle those repairs? Usually, if it's a large expense like advance like that, I'm not going to loan $25,000 in one check. The reason being is if I've got $100,000 out to them and they die the next day or something happens the next day, well, that $100,000 is already gone. And if I take the property back in foreclosure, what still has to be done that hasn't been started? Well, the repairs. So if the after repaired value was say 175, I've already loaned 100, I got to put $25,000 more out to, to do the repairs that hadn't been started. And then I've got holding costs. I, I'm, I might be lucky to just break even on that situation. So how do you handle expenses and repairs? There are a couple of different ways. One, you can just have directed IRA hold back funds and, and instruct us as to how much money you want to send, because we're just going to take your instructions as to how much money we send out and for what amount. 
or you can set up an escrow account through a title co title and escrow company. You can set that twenty five thousand dollars aside, and you can say, "I'll tell you when you can when you can advance the next set of repairs to the borrower." Uh, usually, what you want to do is if you've got a borrower with a large set of repairs, you just want to maybe advance enough for the first set of repairs, or have them pay for the first set of repairs show you evidence of it, provide you invoices, and then you can reimburse them if that's a part of the agreement. You reimburse them for what they put in. Now you got them with a little more skin in the game and you're not at risk of putting too much money out there before you actually have no, before you actually know and verify that the rehab has been started and, and to your liking as a lender. Uh, the rest, get title insurance on your loan. Close at a title company, make sure you've got clear title. Close with an attorney or close with a title company on every single deal. Make sure your IRA is also listed on the as the lender on any insurance policies. So when you go to a bank and get a loan from Bank of America, Bank of America is going to make sure that they're on your farmer's insurance policy showing that there's a lender on this property. Because if the property burns down, they got to cut a check, making sure that the lender is made whole. Same thing goes for your IRA. If your IRA is the lender secured by property, you want to make sure that your IRA is listed on any insurance policy. So if something happens to the house, your IRA gets paid. Always check that property taxes are paid in current. This is very easy to do, but this is something a lot of lender beginning lenders might miss is making sure property taxes are being paid. Your borrower could be paying you on time every every month, but if nobody's paying paying the property taxes, well the county assessor doesn't care about whether you're getting paid as as the, as the bank. They'll take that property due to past due property taxes. So you just want to make sure that you at least have the borrower show evidence that they've made uh, made the taxes or made the payment on taxes, or just go on your county assessor's page and just look up the property and just see how, if the taxes are current. But make sure as the lender, you want to make sure that you've got clear title and you make sure property taxes are being paid. If you're loaning to an entity, entities are a little bit different. You, you, you could ask for a personal guarantee from the individual that manages that entity. Um, a lot, most of the time, I'm not going to do a deal. If I'm loaning to somebody's LLC, I'm going to ask for a personal guarantee because I want to make sure that I, I get my money back and I'm secured. Uh, and don't loan to anyone you would feel uncomfortable foreclosing on. This goes kind of to family. I would say I've seen a lot of relationships kind of um, suffer because somebody loaned to their brother or somebody loaned to their you know cousin and they didn't pay him back. You know, that, don't make uh, the holidays awkward through your IRA investments, I would say. Make sure that you're loaning on people that you would not feel uncomfortable foreclosing on, that they know that they'll get foreclosed on if they miss payments. Um, but sometimes family and friends are just better to keep out of that, I would say. So there's some considerations. Now let's look at a couple of real deals real quick. So first, how does the process work? If you're starting from the very, very beginning stages, how do you get your IRA from like a fidelity over to directed IRA and start using it as a private lending uh, capital source? Well, first you've got to open up an IRA with us, a self-directed IRA. And self-directed is just a marketing term. We've got the self-directed traditional, the raw, the SEP, the simple, the solo K, the HSA, and the ESA. And if you want to open accounts, just make sure to type a little message to Michelle or Darren. They'll help you guys open accounts even today if you want to get those that process started. But that's process that's step process one of self-directing and becoming a private bank with your IRA is get the account open. Number two is you fund the account through either an IRA transfer from one of your other IRAs, a rollover from, from maybe an old 401k or an old 403b, or just by making a contribution to your plan here once it's set up, just like you make a contribution anywhere else. Now you can move, IRA transfers are probably the most common way people fund accounts. You don't have to move all your money to directed IRA. Most of our clients just move enough to do whatever investment that they need to do. So if you've got a half a million dollars at Fidelity, but you've got a borrower that needs 200, you don't need to move half a million dollars to us, just move 200 to us. The way we can facilitate that loan, you can get us the documents showing that your IRA is gonna own a promissory note for 200,000 and leave the other 300,000 at Fidelity if you want. So it, transfers are not reported to the IRS, so you can move money back and forth, IRA to IRA transfers as many times as you like. Once you've got the IRA open and funded, there's a couple documents that we need to if your IRA is going to be a lender and own a promissory note. I always say we need two things. We need a form. 
okay? An internal form that gives us the instruction as your IRA's custodian to make an investment into a promissory note. And we have a specific form called our direction of investment form, okay? We have a specific one for notes. You just fill that form out, has real basic information. Who are you loaning to? Where are we sending the money? How much are we sending? What accounts are we using? Okay, you're gonna fill out that form and then with notes, it's easy because the agreement is the note. If the prop, if the note's going to be secured by real estate, we just need a copy of the note. And what we're looking for as the IRA custodian is to make sure that you've got your IRA or IRAs listed properly as the lender. Okay. Now, if there's anywhere that the lender needs to sign, you don't sign because, again, this is not your note. It's your IRA's note. We have to sign as the IRA's custodian. Most notes, it's just gonna be your borrower that's signing, okay? But anytime that we would, that the investment needs to be signed off as the purchaser, we would sign that as your IRA custodian, but you give us the instruction to sign anything with that form. So we just need the direction of investment form for notes and a copy of the promissory note. From that point on, once we have those two documents and you've got money in the, in the uh, account ready to go, we can fund those investments in a little, little as 24 to 48 hours. If you're working through an IRA owned LLC, I know a lot of our clients have IRA owned LLCs. You just do that through your LLC. You don't have to come through us if you've already got the LLC set up. Okay. The lender on the note will be the LLC. So here's a deal that I did a couple of years back and with my HSA and my Roth IRA partner. Okay. I told you I do a lot of deals out in uh, uh, Texas. Texas is just where I kind of started. I've got a couple of people out there that are real estate investors. And the reason I like loaning to them is I don't really have to worry about their deals. They've got a scale, scalable enough business that I know at the end of the day, as long as my money is secured by the property that they bought with my money, they lose money on that deal. They've got enough other deals going on that they can at least pay me back and make me whole. But the key to this relationship is that it is a relationship. Okay? I've met these people. I vetted these people. I know their track record. And as a lender, you want to know and, and get familiar with the people that you loan money to. I would never suggest that you should loan people money who hit you up on Facebook or hit you up on email. You should be taking your, your potential borrowers out to coffee, or they should be taking you out to coffee. You should be understanding who this person is and do they have a reputable track record? Because at the end of the day, what you're do really doing is you're trusting on them to pay your IRA back. Now, you'll be secured by the property if you close at a title company and you have a deed of trust, okay? But at the end of the day, it's a relationship business and you're really banking on them to make good on their agreement in the promissory note. So me and we'll just call him Bob, we agree to terms. Typically what Bob will do is he'll send me a deal. He'll send me an appraisal that he's already had. He says, Nate, here's a deal in Houston that I've got. The ARV I estimate as this, I need this amount to buy it and I need this amount to fix it up. And this is how much of my own money I'll put into the deal. From that point on, it's up to me to decide whether or not I like the deal or not. The first thing I do once I hit that hits my desk, I look at the property, I go online, I look at Google Maps, I see where it's at. I kind of have an idea what's going on in Houston. And then I'm going to actually ask somebody that I know is, is specializes in Houston and say, hey, do these comps match out? Okay, this is all how my due diligence works. And when you have a self-directed IRA, it's your part of the process to do due diligence on your borrowers and your property. Once you decide that you want a loan on that property, that's when you're going to get a lender's attorney involved or some sort of attorney involved that's going to draft the promissory note, okay? The promissory note is going to have your terms. When's the loan supposed to be paid out, paid off? When's the loan start, okay? How much is the interest payments? When are the payments supposed to be made? One of the things that I like to negotiate too, and this is just something for you IRA lenders, I always have my borrower pay my directed IRA fees, I have fees at directed IRA. They're not a lot, it's $395 per, you know, per, per account. But if my borrower is going to go to Bank of America, Bank of America has fees. When you borrow money from a bank, they have fees. And a lot of times their fees are about 3% of the loan amount. So if they're going to borrow $100,000 from a traditional bank, they're going to have at least $3,000 in fees. Do you think my borrower is happy to just pay $395 in fees? Yeah. So I pass my directed trust company fees onto my borrower and they're more than happy to pay that because it's a cost of doing business. So I do that because I want to make sure my interest is exactly what it is coming in. I don't want my interest to come in and I got to minus fees out of that. So 
Once we agree to those terms, we can literally close in five days or less. I've got to have the account open. I've got to have it funded. And I've got to provide directed trust company with the note purchase agreement or the direction of investment and a promissory note or copy of the note. Okay, on this specific deal, I loaned out $100,000, as I mentioned, $75,000 was the initial advance to buy the property, and then I held back in escrow $25,000 for repairs. They put their own money in the repairs. I inspected the repairs through emails. They sent me copies. They sent me pictures, and I just advanced them money based on the repairs that they already made and they paid for. The terms of the notes said that they would pay 12% annually. Those payments would be made monthly. I would just expect interest only payments because it's a short term note. I don't really care about principal being paid down in the first year. I just want my interest payments. And there would be two points paid up front, which are really paid at closing. So right when we closed on this property, I got $2,000 right back into my IRA accounts here through closing. Now they pay interest. They're going to pay that back or they pay that back through my, my loan to them. But I get that 2% up front right through closing. So I get a little bit of money back that they got to pay me back on. Now, on with my deals, I like to do short-term notes. And I find a lot of self-direct IRA investors like to do short-term notes. Why? Because you get to compound your interest with short-term notes. Never am I going to loan to somebody and I want to be in a 10-year, 20-year, or 30-year mortgage with somebody. Why? Hey, I don't want to be married to somebody that long on a deal in my retirement account. But also, I want my money back so I can reinvest the interest and, and compound my growth. The other thing is also a win-win scenario for the borrower's perspective too, because the borrower, usually the borrowers that I'm loaning to, and again, you guys can loan to whoever you want, but as long as they're not disqualified, but I'm loaning to people that just need my money to buy the property. And then they usually refinance or sell the property after a year. So usually what I'm going to do is I'm going to loan them a, a loan for 18 months. And I call it a balloon. A balloon is really just the loan's going to be amortized over 30. So they make payments as if they were paying it off in 30 but the entire loan amount, the principal balance is due after month 18. Now I always do an optional extension too. Optional extension just means if they wanna keep the property, they gotta pay a point to extend the property for another 12 months, okay? So I've done that actually very recently because you know, with the cost of financing nowadays, the strategy for borrowers to just refinance into better terms isn't there anymore, right? So they could refinance and rates are coming down now, but rates were almost at 8% and even higher for investment property. So it didn't make a whole lot of sense for borrowers to refinance. So they just paid to extend the loan that they had from my retirement accounts. But the initial investment going into it was that they're just going to hold it for a year and a day. So if they sell it, they, they pay long-term capital gains or they refinance to conventional financing and I get all my money back and I can reinvest into their next deal or into someone next else's deal with the interest that I earned too, okay? Why is that beneficial? Well, because I get to compound my interest and I'll show you the effects of compounding interest here in a second. But as far as the promissory note goes, what's going to read on the promissory note? It's just going to show two IRAs on the note. It's going to show directed trust company, FBO, Nate Hare, Roth IRA as to the undivided interest of 75% and directed trust company, FBO, Nate Hare, HSA to the undivided interest of 25%. It's not multiple notes. It's not multiple liens. This is just considered what's called a fractionalized note. Fractionalized because it's two different lenders that own a different uh, ownership percentage of that note. I've done notes with 14 people on it before. It gets a little messy, but I like to do notes with less participants. But any participants you have, especially if they're disqualified people to one another, you can partner them all together on a note, but you got to make sure that all of the capital or all of the interest income that comes in is split pro rata amongst the accounts. It's very easy. If all the accounts are with the same custodian, that borrower, all they have to do is just send one check to directed trust company and directed trust company is going to split that check amongst the different IRAs that, that are being used. Uh, we close a local title company. My notes secured by the property with a deed of trust since Texas is a deed of trust state, non-judicial. And then what directed IRA holds as evidence of my note investment is not a, pro is not a, um, a stock certificate, but they're going to hold the promissory note and the deed of trust. That's the evidence that my IRA owns the promissory note. From that point on, I just lay, sit back and watch the interest payments come in. And if they don't come in, I go to my foreclosure process. I haven't had the foreclosure on anybody, but I understand how the foreclosure process works. Key points to remember, the borrower kept the property on this deal, rented, refinanced to longer-term financing with the traditional bank. 
uh, my Roth and HSA are made whole through the payoff of the refinance, and then I can redeploy that money into the next deal. I like to keep it right around a year because, again, I want to compound my interest annually. And remember, I can't loan money to myself for a disqualified person. We set our own loan terms, which is a cool thing. And IRAs can loan money secured or unsecured, too. You don't have to do secured promissory notes. But again, I'm always going to do secured promissory notes because it helps me sleep at night. If you want to see the effect of compounding interest, let's just say I keep this going and I'm able to compound my interest at 14% annually without even making any additional contributions. If I do this for 20 years with that $100,000, my $100,000 compounded annually for 20 years at 14% will be $1.374 million. So lending is very profitable, but depending on how you set up and you structure your deal. So compounding your interest tax-free is one of the greatest gifts uh, this planet has ever given to us. So uh, I can't remember the, uh, the the saying Einstein had, but it's something to the effect of, uh, you know, basically compounding interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Uh, you understand it or else you're probably the one paying it. So um, let's take some questions at this point. Uh, Michelle, you got some questions for us? Yes. One okay, is, have you ever done seller finance notes in your self-directed IRA? Um, I have not done a seller finance note because that would require me to own the property first. But in the event, let's say that I did have to foreclose on a property and I took it back in foreclosure, would I seller finance it? Yes. Would I? I don't know if I personally would seller finance it. I would probably just keep it as a, as a rental and just rent it. The, the only reason I say that is because usually with seller financing, usually the person that wants the seller financing, they don't want it as an investment property. So as long as it's an investment property, I would seller finance it or I would consider seller financing it to somebody else. But I, I wouldn't seller finance it to an owner occupant, if that answers your question. But I haven't had to do it yet. Perfect. Another one is, are former spouses considered disqualified? Ooh, it depends. So are former spouses disqualified? I mean, legally, if you're if they're not your spouse, no. Now, there are certain circumstances, I'll say, with family or relationships could be closely close enough where they are considered disqualified. Now, I would probably ask, is she the beneficiary on any of your assets or the beneficiary of any of your IRAs? You can no longer be married, but if she's still the beneficiary of your retirement account, she is a disqualified person. I'll give you an example. I'm not married and I don't have kids. So when I set up my IRAs for the time being, my beneficiary is my brother. Okay, I want my assets to pass to him in the case that I die. So even though my brother's not on the disqualified person's list, the fact that I put him as the beneficiary makes him a disqualified person. So I don't know if the spouse is, is um, you know, involved in that, in, in any of your assets, but if they're just, you know, a former spouse and they don't have any ties to your assets, specifically your retirement accounts, then most likely they're probably not disqualified. But just be careful. Again, relationships can be, you know, the, the closer they are, the hairier they can get, I would say. Any other questions, Michelle? Yes. When would it be wise to loan an unsecured note? Would the terms be more strict? So, yes. You know, you got to remember an unsecured note, you don't have collateral. So you're, you're in the event that your borrower stops making payments, it's going to be a bigger headache for you because you have to go through the court system, right? If I loan Michelle money and it's just as an unsecured note, if she doesn't pay me, I have to sue her. That's the only way that I can maybe get my money back. So I, I don't know that I would say that there's a good situation to do unsecured or not. Um, it really just depends on your situation. I wouldn't, I would probably never recommend to do something unsecured. I will tell you though, I did see someone do an unsecured note one time because the person, the borrower had so many assets that they were, they weren't worried about them getting paid back. And it was just a matter of timing that they wanted to do an unsecured note. And this was like a larger deal. This is like a half a million dollar deal. The borrower had a bunch of money. So it was, it wasn't like it was a drop in the pond for them, but the Sorry, the lender had a bunch of money, but also the borrower was with a lot of money and had a lot of assets. So that can always play a factor in that. But just remember, it's still going to be a headache in the event of default because you're not secured by anything. You can't just foreclose and circumvent the court system and get the property like you can, like like I would do in, in Texas if that happened, if somebody didn't pay me. But if you're unsecured, again, you're going to have to fight with the courts and, and try to get your money back. So. 
Any other ones, no, uh, Michelle? Yes. So what okay. kind of professional will help you evaluate your deal and what form do you ask for as a quote for repairs? So um, let me do the repairs one first. It, you can be either a quote from, if you're paying for the repairs, if you're fronting the, the money for the repairs, you probably want to get a quote from their contractor, um, it, you know, depending on how you want to do it, or you just have them pay for it with skin out of their pocket, skin in the game, and then do like what I do is have them show me the invoices for what they paid, show me some pictures of what they did, and then I'll reimburse them for what those invoices say. Um, the, and then the first part of the question was, again, Noah, or Michelle? What kind of professional will help you evaluate your deal? Okay. So I would just say any real estate professional, so find somebody that is familiar with real estate investing in the area that you're looking to loan in. Um, I always I always recommend go to your local real estate investor association meetings. There's a lot of you know good talented real estate investors that you'll meet there. People that are familiar with off market property, people that really know how to wheel and deal. Um, you probably want to have a uh, a realtor in your back pocket, um, not so much for the advice, but for access to MLS. If you need to run comps, uh, sometimes your access to MLS is going to be key. You don't want to rely just on Zillow or Redfin for values. You might have to have a, a, a real estate agent run some comps for you. Um, but I would say as far as like I go, I usually leverage people that I've met through through the real estate meetings. The local RIAs is where I've met most of my investors, investor friends. Perfect, thank you. One more, how yep. many investments can I do annually without flagging the IRS? Really as many as you want. When it comes to lending, there's really no limit. It, it's different than real estate. It's different than flipping. So, and, and really in a retirement account, there's really no flags to the IRS because the whole key to your retirement account is they want you to invest it. There's no limit on how many stocks you buy or, or sell. There's really no limit to how much real estate you buy and sell. And there's really no limit to how much money you do as far as like promissory notes. You can have a hundred promissory notes. I have clients that have a hundred, I have a client that has 130 rental properties in, in an IRA. So there's really no limit um, as to how much you, you do. That's really up to you. But the IRS wants us to loan our money or wants to, the IRS wants us to invest our retirement account. That's what it's there for. So just make sure your money's working for you in some capacity and not sitting on the sidelines getting eat, with, eaten up with cost of living and inflation. Awesome. Nate, one more. Thank you, promise. Okay. Yep. okay. <laughs> but yeah, it's okay. Is there a site link or link that you might know of that shows all 50 states and who is a deed of trust state versus mortgage? Yeah, just literally Google it. So um, literally Google deed of trust versus uh, mortgage state, or you can Google, which might be even more important, judicial versus non-judicial. Usually the judicial states, the judicial foreclosure states are going to be your mortgage states. Your non-judicial states are going to be your deed of trust states. So it just in my experience, the non-judicial deed of trust states are the ones that you have a easier access to the property in the event of default. But just so you know, you can actually take it to the judicial side of it on any state. Any state will allow you as the lender to file a suit against your borrower. It's just the non-judicial states will let you just bypass that whole process and just take the property provided you've done all the steps it takes to foreclose, which is send the notice of default, send the acceleration Post, post it to your county courthouse. I'm kind of oversimplifying, but these are just the things that you want to understand the pro a part of the process. But you send a notice of default, the acceleration of the notice, post it to your county courthouse. And if the borrower still hasn't paid by that time, you can get the property back through foreclosure. So it's a lot easier with a non-judicial deed of trust state in most cases. But yeah, just look it up online. It'll give you the list of the ones that are judicial, non-judicial, deed of trust, mortgage. Okay, go on. Okay, so let me let me just end and I'll give anybody the case study on this. I, I I don't have time to go over the shared appreciation equity loan, but I will say it's a it's a good it's a good deal to understand on how you can actually tie yourself into the equity piece of a loan or equity piece of a real estate deal instead of just the interest payments. And there's some situations where it might make sense for the borrower to give up a piece of the equity on their deal. 
for instance, if I'm going to loan money, say at 12%, and that's my typical going interest rate to a borrower, sometimes that's not going to enable them to cash flow or at least break even on a property. So that might force them to just walk from a specific deal, which is kind of what happened on this deal. But if you can find a win-win scenario between you as the lender or your IRA as the lender and them as the borrower, well, you can negotiate different terms. And sometimes those terms can even equate to the borrower or the owner giving you the lender a piece of the profit when they sell the property. Now, this does not give you ownership rights of the property, but it's just called a shared appreciation loan or a net profit note. I call it a shared equity loan or shared appreciation loan, but but this can be a term in your promissory note that says, hey, when you pay, when you sell this property, not only do I get the interest that you have to pay monthly, but I can get 25% of the equity. It might sound crazy to some people. Why would the borrower do that? Well, I'll just give you an example on this one here. On this specific deal, the borrower couldn't cash flow at 12%. Okay, but this was a good property because it was a mobile home, but it was the land that the mobile home sat on that the real value was in. How property, how, how migration was working in this area is that there was a lot of growth approaching this area where this mobile home sat on, but it wasn't going to hit this area for like five years. So the borrower wanted to just buy and hold this property, but it wasn't a property that could cash flow very well just because of based on where it was located. So at 12%, it didn't make sense for the borrower to borrow money at 12% because they would have dip it, be dipping in their pocket and the rents wouldn't have been able to cover the mortgage that they had to pay to the lender. So what the lender and the borrower decided to do is say, okay, well, how much money could you make on an annual basis through the rents? And if you want to hold this property, let's figure out what interest rate would that equate to to where you as the borrower or the investor would just break even, right? I got rents coming in as the investor. I've got enough rents to pay my private lender or my IRA lender at this case. That just allows them to break even. Now, what's the good thing about breaking even? It allows them to hold the property without, without it being onerous or pain of the payment. Okay? But in exchange for the lender reducing their interest rate from their normal 12 to six, they said, Let's just split the profit 50-50. Let's do a shared equity deal where when you sell this property, you'll keep half of the profit, you'll keep half of the equity, and your I, the IRA lender will get half of the equity. Now, on this specific deal, the IRA lender was a Roth IRA, loaned $50,000 okay, at 6%. So they were still getting 6% annually. Okay, No money out of the pocket of the borrower. Okay, When they sold the property seven years later, they kept it a few extra years, the property was sold for $130,000 and that $80,000 roughly at, at, the, at closing was split 50-50 amongst the borrower and the IRA lender. So the IRA lender, the Roth IRA in this case, got 6% for seven years and got a $40,000 lump sum payment through the sale of the property. The borrower also got a $40,000 lump sum payment when he sold the property. If you think about it on those terms as a borrower, how many properties could you buy if you used none of your own money and stuck $40,000 in your pocket at the end of seven years? None of your own money to buy it, none of your own money to rehab it, none of your own money to make the mortgage payment because the renter was paying it and you stuffed $40,000 in your pocket at the end of the deal. How many deals would you do if that was the, if that was the story? You do every single deal you could find like that. So if you think along those terms and you think about how to create win-win scenarios as a borrower, you can leverage other people's IRAs, make them money, maybe healthier return than they're getting in the stock market, but also put a considerable amount of money in your back pocket. And most of these loans, these loans are not hitting your credit report. So if you're tapped out on your Fannie and Freddie loans at, at 10 loans and you want to go out and buy more property, well, you might be forced to go look at some private capital. But the fact that you can negotiate terms and create win-win scenarios and take the terms outside of just simple interest and make it simple interest and some equity, well, now you got a lot of tools in your tool belt that you can offer potential lenders that have retirement accounts that want to be part of your deal. And what I would say is if you're a real estate investor, okay, looking at using OPI or other people's IRAs, you want to find win-win scenarios on every single investment might be a little different and every single IRA lender might want a little bit different of terms. 
if you think about the different types of people that you're going to encounter out there as a borrower, A, you want to make sure, okay, that you are transparent with what you're doing with the property and that your borrowers understand the foreclosure process and you make the process smooth and painless. But I'm going to skip to two. One of the things you want to make sure of as the borrower is make sure you understand the risk tolerance of each of your lenders. The risk tolerance of me is very different than the risk tolerance of someone past retirement age in their 70s, okay? I'm probably a little bit more adverse to take some, or I'm probably a little bit more willing to take some risk. Meaning if you're approaching me with one of your deals, I might say, hey, let's do a straight equity deal. Why, why don't I get 50% of the equity? I don't really need the income to live on right now. I'm not saying I would do that, but I'm just saying my lifestyle and my time to retire, I can rebound from something that might be a little bit risky. But I would not suggest that you go to somebody past retirement age who's relying on the income and try to pitch them on a shared equity deal. That might be that might not even pay off until they might be passed away by that time. But the thing I want to make sure of is that you as the borrower understand that somebody in their 30s is going to be a little bit more risk tolerant than somebody in their 70s. And as the borrower, you need to make sure you identify that and find a win-win situation. You might even find that somebody in their retirement years, they might not want to be a part of the equity on the deal, but they might take less interest. Okay, Because maybe they're only making money in a CD, paying them a couple percentages but you just pay them six or 7%, that's doubling their return to their retirement account. So potentially maybe you get some cheaper money, okay, that you don't have to give equity up on some of your older borrowers and maybe some of your younger borrowers, you give some, some more options to. But as a real estate investor, you gotta be the one to kind of identify that and identify the risk tolerance of each one of your lenders and their need for money, okay? Be very careful borrowing every penny from somebody's retirement account if they're, if it's their only bucket of money and they're in retirement. I would say be very cautious of that. Maybe you just only borrow some of their money. Because it's very likely that they might need money through some medical you know, things and things. They might pick up the phone and say, hey, I need $20,000 back. I got to go to the hospital. So make sure you identify the different uh, the borrowers that you might run into. Understand the different uses of money will get you access to capital. As a real estate investor, understand the benefits, the pros and cons of using bank financing, the pros and cons to using uh, hard money, and the pros and cons to using private money. But you can really get, get more bang for your buck and buy more property if you can understand how to utilize all those buckets of money. And just to give you an idea, there's $35 trillion dollars in retirement accounts. It's the largest source of America's capital. If you can tap into it, you can buy unlimited amounts of property with other people's money and it doesn't tie to your credit or it doesn't affect your credit, but be responsible with it and make the process smooth and painless for your lenders. I know I went a little bit over. You guys had good questions. I hope this was beneficial to you guys. I hope this was helpful. If you guys want a copy of the uh, slides, I can give them to you today. Just shoot me an email. Uh, there's my email address right there, nate.hair at directed ira.com. We will send up a follow-up email that will have the copy of the recording as well. So if you guys want to rewatch it um, and then copies of the slides, I do want to mention this real quick and I'll take a couple last minute questions if people have it. We do have our 2024 self-directed IRA summit coming up in Dallas, April 19th and 20th. We have early bird pricing all just for one more day. So it ends the end of day tomorrow. So if you haven't been to our self-directed IRA summit, it's probably the best one day crash course that you can get about everything self-directed IRAs. It's taught by our, our CEO, Matt Sorensen, our CFO, Mark Kohler. I'll be there. We've got a panel of real estate experts. We've got a panel of alternative asset experts, and it's going to be a super fun event held at the Galleria, the Westin in Galleria in North Tech, in North Dallas. So get your tickets um, now, between now and uh, tomorrow, you get $50 off any ticket, VIP, virtual, or general admission. But I'd love to see you guys out there in Dallas, April 19th and 20th. And if you are interested in booking a call with me and talking specifically about how we can kind of help facilitate your self-directed IRA needs, if you want to open an account, you can scan that QR code there and book a call with me. Um, and anybody that watches this uh, workshop, always remember, if you open an account, any account, make sure to use the promo code RYR100. It's rethinking your retirement 100. That'll get you 100 bucks off 
any of your accounts that you open here at Directed IRA. So book a call with us, set up an account, uh, get the money moved over if you're looking to, to lend money out. And um, I'll take questions at this point, Michelle. Do I have any more questions? And I appreciate you guys sticking with me for a little bit longer than, than usual. Thank you, guys. Yeah, looks like we have a couple more. One person asked, how do they create the 1098 for a bar borrower? So there's probably some people that you can go to help create that. It wouldn't be something that we create. Um, loan servicing companies, I think, will create that for you. Um, depending on your activity level, um, you might want to find you know, a loan servicer, I would say. Um, if you have a lot of loans out at once, they're, they're, they'll help in the making sure payments are collected uh, and, and what to do when borrowers are asking for 1098s and, and that type of thing. So uh, I hope that helps. It just, we don't, we don't prepare it, but if we need to sign it, we'll sign it as the IRA's custodian. Also, what advantages to use a checkbook LLC for lending? So I would probably say if you're very active, if you're doing a lot of loans and those loans need to be funded quick. So one of the advantages or one of the directed IRA differences is that we allow clients to have what, what I call true checkbook control. So true checkbook control would be where you have an LLC. The LLC is owned by either an IRA, your IRA, or it could be owned by multiple IRAs. What gives you checkbook control is you as the IRA's owner are going to be listed as the manager of that LLC. Okay, You don't own the LLC in most cases. You just manage the LLC that your IRAs own. When we set that up for you through our attorney office, KKOS upstairs, they're going to set you up and add you to the bank account. There's You go to usually Titan Bank or we have a list of banks that will set a bank account up for you that's tied to the LLC. And you basically have the checkbook. You get to write the checks that come out of that bank account for your IRA's investments. Okay. Now, I would say it's probably one of the accounts you want to make sure that you are you get some use out of it. When it comes to real estate, owning real estate, a lot of times the checkbook LLC really helps with owning real estate because if you're doing real estate that's got moving parts and you got to pay contractors, you got to buy paint, sometimes that LLC checking account helps to have so you could just make those small payments. When it comes to notes, though, notes are a little bit more passive. So there's not a lot of moving parts with notes. For instance, my notes, I don't use a checkbook LLC for my notes. Why? Because I don't need it. It's just it's an extra expense for me because all I need to do is just provide the promissory note to directed IRA, right? The direction of investment form. They send the money out to the borrower and then the borrower just pays directed IRA. What do I need to check my checking account for or an LLC for? It's not really giving me more asset protection. My assets are secured in, in my retirement accounts. So I would just say if you're very active and you just need money to go out like today and you can't wait 24 hours for us to process it, the checkbook IRA LLC might come into control or it, you're partnering a lot of accounts together. This is another reason I, I see checkbook control as an as an advantage on lending is let's say you're in one of those circumstances where you've got your IRA, your wife, you want your brothers involved, you got your parents involved. Well, in or, in, instead of sending, pro, having us processing 14 different investments, even though it's the same promissory note, we have to process them individually from each account. Maybe we just dump all of those IRAs into one checkbook IRA LLC that you manage. And again, you can just write the checks and all the money is dumped into one central location. So ease of use, if you've got multiple accounts and activity level, I would think is, is what you want to decide on whether or not you want to set up a checkbook LLC for lending. Perfect. Here's the last question. It says, let's say you want to lend to a fix and flipper. They come to you after they have already secured the property and just need funds to continue their rehab project. Let's say I would like a warranty deed or something that needs to be recorded at the county before giving the money to the lender. Would a title or escrow company still be able to assist at this stage of the transaction because the property already closed before the lender asked you for the money? Repeat the first part of the question. I just missed it because I was reading something. Read the first part of the question again. Let's say you want to lend to a fix and flipper. They come mm -hmm. to you after they have already secured the property and just need funds to continue their rehab project. 
Got it. Got it. So I, I would first ask in that situation, did they secure the property with another loan? Did they go to a hard money lender? Is there a first lien position mortgage on that property from somebody else? If they need more money from my IRA to finish the rehab and they can't get more money from that bank, well, then I'm looking at BB be in a second lien position, most likely. Um, I'm okay being in a second lien position if there's enough equity in that property that I'm not worried about not getting paid if they foreclose. Because here's how first and second liens work if you're not familiar. Let's say they go to Bank of America for their first lien mortgage and Bank of America has got, got, got uh, a lien on the property and they come to me for an extra $20,000 to finish the repairs. Well, I can go behind Bank of America and be in the second lien position, but if that property goes into foreclosure and if the equity in the property is not enough to pay me, Bank of America gets paid first. I get paid second and it literally works like that. So let's say they loan $200,000, I loan two I loan 20 and the property's worth 215. Well, I'm going to be the one that's short $5,000, not Bank of America. They're going to get paid first. They're going to make be made whole. And whatever's left over, I'm going to be in the second lien position. So as long as there's enough equity in the property, you can still loan them money, secure it by the property. Again, if there's no lien on the, on the property, you'll be in first lien. But if there's other liens on the property, if there's other mortgages, you can be in second, you can be in third, you can be in fourth. So you want to know how did they acquire the property? Are there other mortgage companies involved in the in the transaction? One more, Richard. Okay. Just put, if a borrower does not want a 1098, am I as the lender still required to submit the 1098 form to the IRS? To the IRS? I, I don't know that you're required to send that to the IRS. I would probably check. I, I mean, it doesn't hurt to do it. Most of the times, I would just say I don't see borrowers do it unless they're or sorry i don't don't see lenders do it unless their borrowers are asking for it because the borrower is most likely going to be the one that wants it the most because why because they get to write off interest on their personal tax return as far as the ira is concerned there's really no tax savings because it's all tax exempt right so you're just really sending a 1098 just so that the borrower can make sure they get the tax deduction so it'd be very rare that you would be sending it without them wanting it, to be honest, because they're the ones that want it because they want the tax deduction. As far as your IRA goes, it has it has no net effect as to taxes owed or paid inside of the IRA. Awesome. Those are all the questions. Awesome, guys. Well, I hope this was beneficial to you guys. I'm so sorry that we went over, but you had a lot of good questions. Um, again, we'll have the recording out to you guys by tomorrow. You'll get an email since you registered. Uh, if you want these slides, right away. If you can't wait till tomorrow, uh, just email me at nate.harrettdirectedira.com. And don't forget about our self-directed IRA summit and our uh, uh, account special here, RYR100, if you guys want to open accounts. Get with Michelle, get with Darren, make sure they give you that account or schedule a call with me using that. Thanks, guys. Have a good rest of your Tuesday. We'll talk to you guys soon.